Thank you so much for that question. We would like to make a quick break. I know another two people will be able to talk. I would actually, because otherwise um, the issues will be gone, have Jana as a sort of uh, intermission right now, reflecting what the Twitter... Yeah, just quickly, because there are so many questions coming by Twitter as well. Maybe we can just go two. Um, okay, now it's working. There are a lot of questions coming by Twitter, so I just picked two. Um, what about kids that can't learn because they can't, don't have anything to eat. Are there any development policies considering mm -hmm. this previous step is mm -hmm. one question. Mm -hmm. And the other one, why not working more on video literacy? Okay, that, that would be your topic, <laughs> clearly identified. Um, we've had a number of very, very good questions. Um, I think uh, maybe we, we kick off uh, with the food and poverty. Um, you know, you can't eat, uh, you can't learn. One very uh, good program here is school lunches. So the IMF, in its great wisdom, introduced school fees in the 1990s, and they said, well, you know, in order to have sustainability of debt repayment by poor countries, why not simply uh, have people pay for services? The result, predictably, was that people kept their children at home and had them work in the field. Uh, you do the opposite. You provide an incentive for people to go to school by saying there will be a nice, nutritious meal provided for the students who go to school. That is one meal less that the parents need to provide, and it gives uh, the students, the pupils, uh, the energy to actually learn something in school. The question is who's paying for that? Well, uh, it could be the government. It could be development aid. It would be, it's one of the most successful programs that has been conducted by uh, development aid organizations. Would you also like to take the question on global governance? Uh, yeah, I, I'll try. I mean, the, the thing I wanted to say about poor people and uh, how to get poor people involved is an incredibly difficult topic. And again, we are all in the richer half of the human population, all of us in this room. And while there are many, many people who pretend to speak for the poor, very few of them are actually among the poorer half. And one thing that I've tried to do in recent years is to try to talk to poor people, do actual field work in poor countries, six poor countries only, because we have limited resources. We have about $2 million for this. And uh, try to get a description from them, very unstructured, of what the situation is, what are the deprivations that they think are the most important, what would uh, improve the situation the most, what is it really like uh, to live in these situations. And I think that's a start. That doesn't give people input into actual decision-making mechanisms, but at the very least it gives them a bit of a voice to the extent that we can publicize that and gives us, who are uh, pretending to speak in their behalf, a little bit more to go on. Thank you. Local content. No, on this question of oh, fine, good. <laughs> um, I you? don't want to speak for the poor countries of the world, because my country is a middle-level country with tremendous poverty and tremendous wealth. The problem of poverty is not that the poor people I don't want to be involved in government. It's a problem of the privileged and rich who won't give up their privileges because they extract their wealth from the poor. That's why we're rich in Europe and America. The question is, first, there's a change in world balance of power. After the collapse of the East Bloc and the end of the Cold War, we had a, a unipolar world and we saw the consequences. We now have a different situation. China, India, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, the BRICS countries, beginning to say, we don't need you in the North. We can trade between ourselves. We have the knowledge, we have the capital, and the technology. You want to come knocking at our door, let's trade as equals. We're beginning to see a shift in politics. Africa's playing a leading role at the United Nations, which it never did before. These changes are taking place, and they're important changes. We need to be encouraging them. I know, Jürgen, that you get to answer at this uh, particular point. Can I just get you in quickly? Because uh, Dennis has been saying um, uh, the poor don't have a voice. Um, so it's a question of empowerment, and sometimes civil society needs help from other sources uh, to get empowered. You also need sort of money and structures. Um, how much uh, does German Economic Corporation uh, do on that side? Well, I strongly believe, and that's what I said in my initial statement, that civil society and the private sector have to be involved, and uh, that's why we encourage also NGOs, and we 
support uh, their work um, to empower local people to raise their voice. And um, we advocate also observer statuses for various NGOs at the in, in international fora. Sometimes um, they are even part of German government delegations to the UN. And I would like to respond to the question of the gentleman from South Africa about how do we integrate this in, in education. And this is the question not only of access to education, but of the quality of education. And I believe that quality education is an investment in sustainable development, as well as in the environmental resource protection and for social cohesion. And um, that's why it's so important uh, which model um, is taught. Uh, that's why quality education is uh, key, and this has to include how do we uh, treat the planet, how do we deal with the limited resources. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Just very briefly on uh, local content and maybe on video literacy. Um, for local content, really, governments need to be responsible. They need to take care of, even in Germany, we have the government uh, having a retail price maintenance, having a lower VAT, yeah, even here we need support to produce low, uh, country, to uh, produce local content, and we are 100 million people speaking German. Imagine of a smaller country in, in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it really needs the government to support this. On video literacy, I don't care which kind of literacy, as long as the content reaches the reader or the viewer or whatever. So it doesn't matter really whether it's video or whether it's audio, or whether it's paper or whatever. A little bit deeper on video literacy. So we all think this. Um, we are becoming more and more visual. For example, we don't know how to um, describe a scent anymore. We more and more visual, more and more visual. But we are not proficient in visual literacy. All of us speaks a little bit of a dialect because not all of us are video producers and editors and don't understand the rule behind producing a good piece of audiovisual material. So unfortunately, there is a big need in training of young generation in visual literacy because yeah. it could be a subliminal message embedded in that piece of video that I understand because I used to be a TV producer, but if you're not, you don't. And you think that just because you take your little video on your camera, you understand some of these dynamics. There is a science behind it. There is psychology, there is sociology. There are a lot of studies and technology behind it. So I am an advocate for visual literacy in terms of <laughs> empowering people to understand where are the tricks behind it. And I stole this idea from Dean Daly, who is the dean of the School of Film at UCLA, and she's very adamant about this, and she teaches it. So I would be all for visual literacy. Another thing I wanted to say, and just I wrap up, I shut up, um, is I've heard value, global literacy. I think it's all about human potential. So like in the Renaissance, being Italian, I like that period. Where are we now? I mean, who are we as human beings today and where are we going? And which are the value that should define us of human being of the 21st century? And then once we have that clear and you see more of social consumption, you see more attention to environment, you see less greed, uh, let's build that future together. But it, it's a big philosophical question, and we have a philosopher on the panel that I would love to <laughs> yeah. debate more. <laughs> to hear more. Um, actually, uh, yeah, two more questions, one second, uh, because there's one question that hadn't been answered properly, and that was uh, uh, the gentleman uh, from South Africa who says, and I, I think this is actually more a philosophical question, uh, we actually know where we are. I mean, sort of, uh, certainly the analysis has been clear and whether one does believe in the two degree goal as far as climate change is concerned or not, um, we know that we've actually got to get um, our bums moving. Um, why is it, Professor Pogger, and this is really a philosophical question, why is it so difficult for us to do what the gentleman has said, i.e. think again about the Western model, know that it doesn't work for everybody on this planet and therefore sort of come to a common agreement and say, well, let's do it in a different way because then we ensure our survival. Yeah, I think the, the big deficit here is leadership, right? We have uh, short-term oriented politicians. These politicians are looking ahead to the next election. Corporate executives are 
basically they become executives at the tender age of 58 or something like that. They have five or six years to go and they're interested in their stock options, they're interested in the company doing reasonably well over the next few years. And so why take costly measures now in order to make the long-term future better if you have uh, the means of enriching yourself relatively quickly? And the same is true of the developing countries now, right? China, we just heard the great success story about poverty eradication, about which I could say a thing or two, but anyway, uh, the uh, Chinese, how did they achieve it? Well, they created a car industry that is bigger than the United States car industry. There are now more cars being produced in China than in the US every year and sold. And India, similarly, there's now the Tata car, so you can get for 100,000 rupees, you can get a car, $2,000, you can get yourself a car. Now that is mad, you know, why are they going down the same route if they already know that this is a crazy way to go? Why not build highly efficient railroads, for example, and make cars very expensive, make it very difficult to get around by car and so on and so forth? On the other hand, Again, why can't we also sort of take a step back? Of course we need yeah. to, of <laughs> course we need to, but it's harder to achieve that politically. I'm not saying this is defensible, but it's harder to achieve it in the United States, for example. Go to the Americans and say, well, sorry, you guys went down the wrong road, no more cars, let's do high-speed railroads now, right? These guys would say, no, it's very hard to make them. But India and China would have had the chance to go a different route, and uh, unfortunately, so far, they aren't doing it. Dennis, was one quick answer? I want Deutsche Welle to lead the revolution against capitalism and exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> I've promised two more questions. There's a lady over there um, and the gentleman, one of you two, whoever is quickest, going to the, <laughs> the race of the fittest. Why doesn't the lady get up? The blonde lady, come up to the microphone. Okay. Yep. And then Can it's you. Just, just uh, first of all the lady, then it's you, sir. And then we need to sort of tie it up. No. Okay. Hi, I'm Kairi. I come from Estonia, which is a tiny country. Uh, I have a short comment, but a very provocative one. Um, in my opinion, there is no point in talking about education or poverty or millennium development goals if we don't act in sustainable development in environment. There's no point in saving children in Africa if there is no planet for them to live on. Uh, so it's not two sides of the coin, but sustainable development of environment is the metal the coin is made of. I'm 28, I don't have kids. In the future, I might maybe hopefully have kids, but it freaks me out to think that my kids will grow up in a world that has wars over water and food, not over oil like we have today. Thanks. Thank you very much. And if the gentleman could also be quick in his remark. Yes. Um, the, my question or statement is to Ms. As Frau Asler, Usler. Um, I just want some clarification because you are with the, uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Development Cooperation in Germany, as I understand it. But the minister, Mr. Hal Nebel, is on record saying he does not believe in development cooperation. So is there a credibility gap here, or, what is, or has that position changed? Or can you clarify um, in your official capacity if this is true? Because we are in Germany now, and great topic, great uh, entertainment, great food, intellectual stimulation, nice boss trip. But if the German minister says he doesn't believe in bringing us here to talk about these tough issues, um, then we have a problem. I think that should be answered straight away and then we could reflect on the young lady's remark. Thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to clarify a misunderstanding and I cannot believe that this minister said it. The minister is the minister for, minister for economic cooperation and development. And I think he stresses very strongly that it is not about developing development aid, it's about enabling our partner countries to have a, an economic development 
in order for to grow out of poverty and to support the private sector, to support civil society on an equal footing. And that's why, for instance, we try to encourage German companies, particularly in Africa, to come and, for instance, um, with best practices to support local small and, small and medium-sized companies in bringing them up. Or we have microfinance uh, and other innovative financial instruments. It's a new concept of development aid. It's development cooperation. No, it is, and it's the name of the ministry. It's the ministry, since 50 years, by the way, the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, because we believe that economic development is key to development. Economic cooperation and economic um, investments uh, Small businesses are key to Can development say, of every country. With my Latin American Development Bank hat, they are shareholders and a huge donor contributor. And I have to say, among the different government, um, they, they're actually very integrated and systemic in the approach they give uh, financing for development. And, and it's sustainable development, a lot of forestry work, for example, a lot of economic growth. And if you look at the trade between Brazil and Germany, Germany is the first partner, so, and, and Brazil is doing very well, so there is something working. Well, as it comes to money, Germany had, th for the last three consecutive years, Minister Niebel fought for increased budgets. So we never ever had such a lot of money for our economic cooperation with our partners. For further clarification, a talk between the two of you just after this, because I'm getting... No, no, Dennis, I haven't forgotten you. Uh, don't worry. Uh, who could forget you? Um, we, we are uh, sort of under something that is called time pressure, uh, because you all want to go into the other workshops. So I have promised my panel the last word on this podium, and we're going to kick off with Dennis. Last word, what's going to... Apart from what you want to say now, in five years' time, which tummy ache don't you have? Wait a minute, say again. In five years' time, which tummy ache don't you have anymore? I would like to say that we have trade and not aid. I would like to say that we do not have barriers to trade, it's like subventions from rich countries that kill industry and agriculture in less developed countries. I would like to see that we do not propagate the idea that the market is so free that the very small companies we say are the big employers get crushed by the big ones by a free market. There has to be government intervention to manage the market. That's our experience in South Africa and many countries of the world. Uh, I would like our education system to come back to the topic, to talk about the realities of these things. Put the different points of view and show the consequences of impoverishment that the professor has described to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. In five years' time, Jürgen. I'm, I'm very close to, to my friend, the dear professor. I think in five years' time, uh, global means local beforehand. Yeah, to strengthen local, then we can be truly global. Thank you. Christiana. I, just got, I, I want to say thank you. That's it, because it's spoke already too much. <laughs> Which leaves me with all of that. I would like to say that we remain committed to focus on education as the key element of uh, sustainable development beyond 2014, because that's when the decade, the UN decade ends, and there's still a lot of work to be done. And Professor Pogge. Yeah, can I quickly say something about Estonia? In f <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Half a sentence. Okay. Basically, you're right and you're wrong. You're right in so far that sustainability is the foundation of everything else, but of course, how do we get sustainability if not through poverty eradication and education? We need a real effort. We need profound changes at the institutional level. It's not enough that we all do the good thing because there are not enough of us and we can't change enough. We need changes at the political level. And that's also my answer to what I want to see over the next five years. I want to see... Forget. <laughs> <laughs> the grand gesture was, you just said that. <laughs> Put it in two more words, please. Yeah. What we need is basically a global movement that is focusing on the basic rules of the game that have been emerging over the last 20 years of globalization. We now have a supranational order 
that is much more influential, much more powerful than it ever was before, that dominates in Trump's national institutional arrangements. The space that governments have domestically to get things solved is uh, very much diminished. And we need a global movement that pressures politicians to change that supranational order in the interests of future generations and the present poor. Thank you very much. And this grand guest gesture was a really to say thank you to all my panelists. Before you rush away, let me just quickly um, repeat what the wonderful lady was saying. The metal is uh, the, uh, the two terms, education and sustainable development, are the metal of the coin. So uh, I'll leave you with that notion. And uh, Jana, sorry, no more time, because otherwise uh, I think I'm, I'm not going to be um, uh, want it anymore. We see each other here uh, after your next panel session, after your next workshops, uh, for the closing ceremony. I invite you to come back here into the plenary session. And thank you very much. If you want to listen more to Professor Pogger, there is actually a tag on the Deutsche Welle homepage uh, that you can find because uh, Professor Pogger has been doing one of those TED lectures, which are short, snappy, and unfortunately, Christiana, very boring because it's one person talking to a camera. So, have a great day. <laughs>